So thank you, Tom, and the rest of the committee for the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, as Tom said, I'm David, and I'm going to be presenting joint work with some uh, collaborators. Uh, Blake Anderson and Scott Fleur are here today, and Chris Shenefield is back at the office. So I'd like to start off by giving some background. First, I want to talk about some previous work and some related work. The most important is uh, Riston Partnielek uh, in 2010 showed us that randomness can go terribly bad when there is a virtual machine restart involved. And I'll, I'll go over that in more detail later. This is really important work that we build on in what we did. And there's also uh, more recent work, uh, an active scan of HTTPS servers done by Bach and others. Uh, non-disrespecting adversaries for GCM. And what they showed was that there are TLS servers out there that implement the GCM-based cipher suite, and the requirement for distinct nonces is not met by some of these servers. So in our work, we did passive uh, inferences. We did passive monitoring of a network and then made inferences on that, not active. But it's similar in spirit in that we find uh, flaws in implementations um, due to repeats. And some related work that's really important is uh, Bernard Coey, Halderman, uh, Henninger, and Valenta have some ongoing related work that has similar findings to our own. So thank you, Nadia, for talking with us about that. I want to take um, a, a far step back and kind of present the philosophical approach that we have to, to better explain how the, the work we're going to be presenting in detail relates to the, the bigger picture. And what we have is uh, a threat-driven approach to cryptography. And you've probably heard in the industry people talk about uh, you know, a threat-centric approach to cybersecurity, and we, we very consciously mean the same thing here. So I want you to pretend for the rest of the presentation that you are an information security analyst and you're responsible for protecting uh, some set of assets, right? So our InfoSec person is on the right, and there's a set of assets that you need to protect. There's a set of vulnerabilities in your information systems, and you have controls like anti-malware, antivirus, and transport layer security to protect communications. And these your controls are your protections, and then there's a set of threats that you need to worry about. And it's some adversary that wants to get at your assets and steal your data or you know, cause your power grid to go down or you know, do some other damage. And it's really important to think about things in terms of what are the adversary's capabilities, what are their motivations, and that helps you to um, under understand and prioritize uh, what vulnerabilities you should be paying attention to and so on. And you'll notice my uh, my threat icon here is intended to look like either uh, a warfighter or a thug or somebody who works for organized crime, which is the appropriate thing for the real world. And if you haven't read Phil Rogaway's excellent essay on the moral character of cryptography, which you know, touches on the, the importance of appropriate symbols, I encourage you to read that. So you're responsible for protecting information assets that might include a data center um, at the, it's the bottom right there, uh, a campus network that has a bunch of you know, wireless clients and other clients on it. And then, of course, there, you might use cloud services, which is essentially somebody else's data center over the internet, and a set of mobile devices, and they all have uh, information. And then the orange lines are intended to illustrate the encrypted connections that are, we're relying on to actually protect all this information. Right? So, the communication security is critical, and uh, it has to be done right. And as an information security person, you should ask the question, you know, is it being done right? And we have a way of talking about this, which is crypto visibility, which the idea being, as an information security person, do you actually have an understanding of uh, where cryptography is being used and, and how correct it is? So, you want to be able to ask questions and an have answers like, is it encryption in use where it's needed? 
is sensitive data being appropriately protected? Are there active attacks or exploits going on? Are there bad certificates in use, you know, bad, you know, keys that are being trusted that shouldn't be trusted? And then the focus of the talk today is around uh, weak cryptography that's being used. And that can, you know, there are two major categories there. One being, you know, sometimes obsolete cipher suites and, you know, inadequate key sizes are actually used. And it's very valuable to get a, a view of, you know, where they're being used. And, you know, if somebody's using 1024-bit RSA, that may or may not be, you know, security critical depending on where it's being used. And then also there's a set of implementation flaws, right? There might be a cipher suite that uh, is a strong cipher suite, but then the implementation uh, is incorrect, and that's causing a problem, right? So in our work, we focus on using passive network monitoring that is aware of TLS sessions and aware of cryptography as a way to provide this sort of visibility. So let's move on to detecting flaws. We use what we call the multi-session monitoring model. And essentially, you can monitor the network at just one point, but uh, you have to have an elephant's memory, right? Because if you want to look for something like uh, a collision between the pseudo-random number generator state in two different sessions, you need to have a long-term memory. And that enables you to you know, find sessions that might be separated by a, a great distance in time. And of course, you can monitor at multiple places, multiple networks, and that gives you, you know, more visibility. But, you know, a single monitoring point is adequate. So this is our simple model uh, of TLS. I'll go into that more later. But the important thing is the PRNG, you know, it should have some really large set of possible states. But if it has a, a small typical set, typical in, in Shannon entropy terms, then, you know, an attacker can potentially, um, you know, exploit this fact by, you know, finding sessions that actually collide, and it's feasible to do if the typical set's small. The monitoring tools that we used is an open source package that uh, Blake and I and some other people put together, which the package is called Joy, and it can turn a PCAP or a live network capture into JSON descriptions of the network traffic. It has kind of a flow monitoring viewpoint, except it's much richer than flow, but it's not a per packet, it's a per flow thing. And it's open source, and like all great open source, it's, uh, you know, the documentation sucks. And if you're interested in it, please send us an email. So I'm going to touch on virtual machines a little bit, because they're really important for uh, understanding the, uh, um, some of the failure modes. So, you know, a virtual machine snapshot is basically just a set of bits that can be stored and then later cloned into other running images. And a really important uh, use case for this in practice is something called auto-scaling. And in auto-scaling, there will be uh, a server that has a hypervisor, and uh, it runs an, an image of... You know, say it runs the, you know, one of these images here, and then when the load on it increases, it'll spin up a new virtual machine uh, with another copy of the same image so that it can provide, you know, the greater scale for the same service. So that's called auto-scaling, and the, it's important to realize the difference between a volume snapshot and a full snapshot, right? And this is uh, something that, uh, you know, Rustin Part you like, uh, introduce this, but let me cover it again to make sure that we're all on the same page. A volume snapshot is an image of a bootable disk. And by contrast, a full snapshot is an image of the random access memory as well as the disk. So if you start a VM from a volume snapshot, you're going to have the, the latency of a boot Whereas with the full snapshot, you won't have the, the boot latency. You basically copy the image into running memory, you tweak a couple of things, and then you're good to go. So a volume snapshot is not vulnerable to the attacks that we're going to be describing in a VM restart situation, but a full snapshot does have these vulnerabilities. And a slight nuance is, of course, that there are operating systems that, that store 
uh, random seed on, on volume snapshot, but that's um, a minor thing that we didn't focus on. So in our VM experiment, we worked uh, to duplicate some of the failures that we've seen in the wild in, in a lab setting so that we could make sure that we were understanding them. And we also worked with several different um, you know, uh, enterprise offerings for virtual machines to investigate you know, which of these would actually have these types of failures. And the first is we worked with a malware sandbox environment and uh, ThreatGrid is the particular one we worked with and they use a full snapshot. Just to make sure everybody understands what I mean is uh, a malware sandbox is a dynamic execution environment where you can introduce an executable sample into uh, an, an operating system and then the operating system will run that executable. It could be Visual Basic or JavaScript or EXE or whatever. It'll run that and then after running it, it will check to see what is it was it good or bad, right? So it's used in malware detection. And uh, several other environments, Docker and VMware linked clones, we tested, and they used uh, the volume snapshots, right? And so we did not observe the failure on that. And th the reason we took this approach, right? We checked a bunch of things, right? Because in, in software, it's turtles all the way down, right? That, there can be an application, a container under that, a virtual machine under that, an operating system under that, right? And we, we talked to a bunch of people that, that work with virtual machines, and uh, you know, what we heard from them was they, they were very glad to hear about you know, ways of testing to, to make sure that the turtle below you isn't misbehaving in a way that undermines your security, which I think is a, a, a good way to think about it, right? That you can have the best possible uh, application, but if you run it in, you know, one of the turtles below can subvert it. So there are a number of different uh, scenarios where, you know, TLS failures can occur. And you're probably familiar with the TLS protocol, but just to review a few things quickly, there is a field in the initial handshake, both the server and client hello, the initial messages that they send, and it's called random, that's the name of the field, and it serves as a random nonce in the sense that uh, it provides anti-replay protection, and it's also used as a unique input for key derivation purposes, right? Those are the main functions it has. And for the client, it's supposed to have uh, the time at the, in, in the initial 32 bits, and for the server, it's not supposed to have that, but then again, it's not really fully specified. The server is supposed to make it uh, distinct, right? It's not literally, it, the field is called random. The, the RFC is a little bit, uh, you know, loose on exactly how it's supposed to be formed. And in practice, you know, we, you know, some people don't set the time when they should, and some people put a time in the server uh, nonce, even though they're not required to do that, so. Uh, but but the, what's important about these nonces is, is that if there's a PRNG state collision, then you can observe a collision in the nonces. So we have the following simple model of, of TLS that I showed before. Let me explain it in a little more detail. So essentially, we have uh, the observable fields, the, the time field if it's present, the, the random, and a client key exchange, which is something that contains either the RSA ciphertext or uh, Diffie-Hellman or elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman value. And there's an entropy source that feeds into a, a PRNG, and the PRNG is some software thing that is typically part of the operating system. Um, and the PRNG will feed into a nonce generator. That's just our, our term for that. There's some logic that actually reads from the PRNG and writes it into the nonce, and then there's the cryptographic component that, that generates the other field. And the, the clock is fairly separate from all this, right? So you can think of this as like a directed acyclic graph, right, where a, a failure will propagate along the direction of the graph. So there are essentially four main categories of failure modes that, that we observed. And our catch-all, so, so to speak, is what we call an aberrant implementation. This is something that fails to conform to the spec and 
probably isn't really trying to conform to the, the TLS specification, right? So these are interesting, and we uh, observed a number of these, you know, malware, uh, you know, does this sometimes, and some non-malware applications do it as well. It's not clear what the non-malware applications are trying to achieve. The malware is apparently trying to uh, cut down on computational cost or something like that, although uh, that's speculation. And in an aberrant implementation, the, the fields, they might be fixed, they might be repeating, they, they're going to behave in some way that's, that's unpredictable and, and doesn't correspond to the spec. A PRNG flaw is, is much more interesting. So in, in this case, the PRNG is going to be a repeating value, and it might be, for example, something that updates no greater than uh, once a uh, millisecond. And so th that's one of the failure modes that we observed. And in this case, so the, the PRNG state will be repeating, and the repeating values will feed into the um, nonce generator, and they may feed into the client key exchange. And the reason that the, the random value might be identical and the client key exchange wouldn't is because the, the entropy might um, reset the PRNG in between the calls, right? And so it's not um, completely deterministic when that reseeding happens. So sometimes it's possible to see a random that uh, repeats with a client key exchange that doesn't. And, and lastly, the, you know, maybe the really interesting thing is the multiple running instances of a full snapshot, right? So th that's a big phrase, but trying to be specific here, remember the full snapshot copies RAM. And when you have multiple running instances, that's the, the case of, you know, somebody has made these, these clones, and the, the, when, a clone, it, when each clone initially starts, its PRNG state is going to be identical, at, as shown here. And so similar to the, the previous case, the, the random may repeat and the client key exchange may repeat. And oh, if, if there is a... Uh, client key exchange repeat, you'll definitely see a random that's repeating as well. And the last case is the least interesting, which is an active network scan. There are some network tools that will do HTTPS scans, and these are things like, you know, if you wanted to find out what Cypher Suites, you know, servers are offering, you have to make, construct a client hello and send it to them. And so these scan tools will basically build one hello and send it to many different destinations. And so they're, they're pretty easy to recognize. And in fact, if you do this kind of monitoring in the wild, you'll actually see scan services the, you know, that are network, you know, internet-based scan services, commercial services in, in action. So here's the, the field identification chart that essentially summarizes uh, the, the interesting cases that I just explained. So in this chart, each line is intended to correspond to a single session, time is increasing down the page, and so for the aberrant implementation, things might be repeating, uh, they might even be fixed. More interestingly, the, the PRNG failure is going to have the random values repeating and possibly a client key exchange repeat, and that's going to be, uh, for the, the failure mode that I described earlier around the slow to update PRNG, uh, that's going to be something that happens uh, quickly. The, the sessions will be uh, successive and with a very small time interval. And in contrast, the multiple running instances of a full snapshot, there might be a very long time period, you know, uh, hours or days or more. And in the PRNG failure case, it's, it's going to be the same internet address, right? That you, when you're monitoring, you'll see this, this one device is screwed up. And, um, but in the multiple running instances, case, the addresses might be different, right? Because there are uh, systems that allow you to boot um, um, you know, multiple running instances on different addresses. Of course, you know, something like autoscaling is typically, typically used with a load balancer, so there'll be a single IP address, and then when you, you contact that address and it farms out your, your session to uh, something behind it, it's, it's very complex, but in principle it is possible to, to see these different things. Uh, different addresses. So here's a really quick summary of some of the observations that we did. We, we monitored 
uh, two enterprise networks with about uh, 1,000 hosts. And so we actually have other observations than this, but I wanted to show you know, a very bounded set with about 30 million TLS sessions in it. And we saw these four instances of the aberrant, um, uh, the aberrant case, and one instance of the PRNG library failure, one instance of the VM uh, snapshot failure. And by instance, what I mean is not a single session, but uh, an implementation that, that had a flaw and w was causing this. And it, I think in every case, there were for multiple sessions. So, uh, so it seems like they're, they're um, reasonably prevalent. And to give a sense on the, the work that we did to, to verify the, some of the failure modes within the uh, lab environment, so this is a, showing a, a VM, uh, a sandbox run of the test script malware, which had, let's see, six runs, and this, this random value repeated five times, and the client key exchange repeated five times as well. So, and then, you know, there were other instances where the, you know, with, with different malware samples that the random would uh, repeat and the client key exchange wouldn't, and that means that something else is going on on the OS that's causing the entropy to, to recede the, you know, before the client key exchange is generated. And so it's interesting, you know, we have the tor2web.org is being used by this malware, uh, probably in an attempt to hide, although I'm not sure that's a good attempt to hide. And I want to quickly touch on cryptographic attacks and then, you know, head to some conclusions, right? So what bad things happen if you see something like this on your network, right? Well, obviously replay attacks work, cut and paste uh, attacks will work in a, in a session that has the, uh, the same uh, encryption and authentication keys. Uh, a really important problem would be a flawed server that did uh, DSA or ECDSA signing because private key recovery would be possible in that case. And so we, you know, deterministic uh, DSA and ECDSA looks like an even better idea after you do this kind of analysis. Uh, with a flawed client, if you can act as a server to the client and get the server to, uh, sorry, to get if you get the client to actually complete a session with you, then you just learned a key, and that could potentially be the key that's used in another session, right? So that's an obvious sort of attack. Um, a more subtle attack would be, if you can't convince the client to authenticate you, maybe you can get them to downgrade to an export type cipher, and then you can break the export type cipher, and then, you know, that would give you access to keys that might be used in other sessions as well. So RSA key transport is especially bad because a server, an attacker can replay a colliding session and cause symmetric keys to collide, and that does a lot of damage. Plain text leakage for a bunch of cipher suites, um, and then you know, potentially authentication key leakage if you're performance crazy. So I, let me try to hit some conclusions real quick. So these, these types of failures do happen, and they're worth studying, and especially I would say for future work, the aberrant implementations look really interesting because some people uh, seem to be, you know, not conforming with the spec, and that's very interesting, right? If you're trying to uh, actually make sure that things are secure and somebody's not really following the protocol, that's nice to know. So, so passive network crypto visibility uh, can help to detect these types of failures, and, you know, what I'm hoping is that through work like this, the good guys can have the same visibility that the bad guys do, right? Because bad guys already, you know, they don't need our open source tool. They have something way better than what we have. Uh, but, we, you know, getting some visibility into where the uh, cryptography needs to be better or needs to be used where it's not being used is, is a good thing. And multi-session monitoring is a big part of that. Our conclusions for people who implement cryptography, right, you know, TLS shouldn't use RSA encrypted key transport, so, you know, thank you, uh, TLS 1.3, for not doing that. And for robustness, um, deterministic uh, DSA or ECDSA is a good thing. There's an alternative that you can do if you're concerned about maintaining your FIPS 140 interoperability. There's a Cisco blog on that that, that we implemented in some of our uh, code, which is to stir in 
a pseudorandom function of the message into your entropy pool before you do a signature, right? which achieves the same security properties, and you can do that in a NIST conformant way. So for, for authentication, authenticated encryption, we suggest you know, use something robust like AES GCM SIV, which is some you know, emerging work that's really attractive. And I think that that should be the default. You, know, you should use that instead of using GCM unless you, know, you absolutely can't for some you know, a, a, you know, real high performance reason. And um, if you're using a method that's not robust, then testing it is really important, right? So, and there's other ways to test it than, than hooking up a network monitor, and, and any testing is good. So before I conclude, uh, I noticed some other vendors uh, had shameless plugs for the fact that they're hiring. We're hiring too, both for research and coders. Um, and uh, thank you for your attention today. We have time for only one very quick question. Um, so in Quaker. your slides, you said that TLS doesn't specify that the server should include the GCM, uh, the GMT time, but it should. And you can't cut and paste records between sessions unless both sides have RNG failures, right? Because either side's nonce changing is enough to change all the encryption keys. Uh, you can cut and paste whenever the authentication key is reused. And if you replay a session, Yes, you, you then, replay the then, whole session yes. together. I think, I think the logic flow on the slide was slightly off, and I think you caught that. Thank you. OK, um, in the interest of time, I'll shut up there. Thank you. All right, let's thank uh, Dave again.